Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, we are going to do a second check, a uh, bolted connection check example, where this time we're looking at um, loads in both the parallel and perpendicular directions. The other difference about this example compared to the last example is that in this connection, all of the members are wood. So we have a wood, wood, wood connection. As you can see from the section on the left, wood, wood, wood in all three. And so that means we're going to have to check both sides of the connection. The one side, which has just the beam, I'm gonna label this one as the beam. And the other side, which has the two um, parallel braces, one on either side of the beam. You can see that the bolted connection has a countersink right here. So that's gonna affect our thickness calculation when we go to calculate the thickness of the brace. Um, and uh, you can see there's two bolts and uh, we're assuming a wet untreated condition with a standard term loading. So our KD is gonna be equal to one. And we're making an assumption that when the connection was fabricated, the moisture content of the wood was less than 19%. So it was fabricated basically dry. And this is gonna affect our KSF factor, the service condition factor for fasteners. Okay, so our beam is a two by 10, which we can uh, easily get the size of, and our braces are two by sixes, one on either side of the two by 10. And you can see the angles given 45 degrees, and uh, we're also given the size of the bolts. Half inch diameter uh, A307 bolts. And uh, the other geometry of the connection is given, just in terms of where those bolts are located um, with respect to the brace and the beam. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, first things first, um, let's determine all of our modification factors. So we already determined that KD equals 1.0. Let's go ahead and figure out what KSF should be. Our service condition factor for the fasteners. As we mentioned, we're talking about a dry uh, condition when the wood was fabricated and our service condition is wet. So we're looking in this column and you'll see we're dealing with a bolted connection. So regardless of what is the orientation of our connection, our KSF factor is going to be 0 0.67. So KSF equals 0 0.67. What about our other service condition factors? Um, that's for glue lamb, so we need the one for, here we are. Here are our service condition factors for the wood. So in some cases, for example, in row shear, we need our KSV, which is our longitudinal shear service condition factor. So we are doing a wet service condition, but our least dimension is 89 or less because we have basically two by tens and two by sixes. So the lesser dimension of those is 38. So therefore we have our longitudinal shear, KSF is gonna be 0 0.96. We have our KST, which we'll need for net tension is 0 0.84. So KSV is 0 0.96 and our KST equals 0 0.84. Our KT equals 1.0 because we're untreated. And our KH, our system effect factor is 1.0 as well because we only have one of these connections um, that we're checking. And they don't share, there's no multiple connections sharing one kind of load here. Okay, so then uh, what about our bolts? Let's just get all our ducks in a row. So bolts, our DF is half inch, right? So that's 0.5 times 25.4, so we have a 12.7 millimeter bolt diameter. And our hole size is going to be two millimeters bigger than that. So I'm going to assume that the diameter of the hole is 15 millimeters, just rounding up to 13 and adding two millimeters. So whenever we're cutting holes to look at net section uh, for, you know, if we when we have group tear out or when we have a net tension checks, uh, we're going to consider that the uh, the hole size is 15 millimeters. Okay, so before going any further, let's also check our spacings and make sure that they are adequate. 
Okay, so in most of this problem, we're going to separate by the beam and the brace. Okay, so I already mentioned the beam is the horizontal piece here. The brace is the piece that's on the diagonal. So let's check the beam first. Okay, all of our different checks that we have to do for spacing. So for example, unloaded edge distance. What is our unloaded edge distance in this case? Well, where is our unloaded edge? From the point of view of the beam, the bolts want to move up this way. So they will be moving towards the top edge. So that top edge there is the loaded edge. And the bottom edge down here is going to be the unloaded edge. So that means that my unloaded edge distance is that 100 millimeters right there. Okay, so then what is our requirement for unloaded edge distance in the beam? That is um, 19.05. So if I were to go back to um, the diagram that I drew, or the similar diagram that's in the standard, um, we will see, let me zoom out a little bit more, um, we're talking about our um, unloaded edge distance, sorry, right here. So this is for load perpendicular to grain. I have my unloaded edge distance it has to be greater than or equal to 1.5 DF. If I'm loading, looking at load per parallel to grain, I am going to use EP here, which is also the max of 1.5 DF or um, one half of SC. Now, in this case, I don't have any SC. There's no spacing perpendicular because I only have uh, one row of bolts in the parallel to grain direction. So if I look back at my, um, oops, if I look back here, uh, I only have one row of bolts in the parallel to grain direction. Now, why am I looking at both of those conditions? That's because this load on the beam has one component parallel to grain and one component perpendicular to grain. So I have to satisfy both of those um, spacing conditions simultaneously. But anyway, so they're the same for unloaded edge distance in both directions. Okay, what about the loaded edge distance? Okay, our loaded edge distance here is gonna be this distance, which is simply 235 minus 100. So that's gonna give us 135, so that's our EQ, 135 millimeters. And the requirement for EQ is that it has to be greater than 4.0 DF, which in our case equals 50.8, so that's two inches. Okay, so that's okay. This one up here was okay. Okay, what about for the um, spacing requirement? Okay, so I'm gonna have two different spacing requirements. Um, I only have one spacing here because I only have uh, one row of bolts pretty much. So this is my spacing between the bolts and it's 99 millimeters. Now I have to satisfy two spacing requirements, one for the parallel to grain component of the force and one for the perpendicular to grain component of the force. So if I look back here for the parallel to grain component, if this is our beam oriented the same way as it was in our diagram, then I have my spacing requirement SR or SP in 08619. Same for both editions, but just with a different name. And I see that it's 4DF, okay, for that horizontal spacing requirement, the spacing per parallel to grain. Then if I go to, so it's called SR here in 08614. Then if I go to the next page where I'm looking at my perpendicular to grain load, so this is for the perpendicular com to grain component of the brace force. I also have a spacing requirement. This time in 08614, that's called the column spacing requirement because for vertical load, the rows are vertical. But in 08619, it's called SP, which is the parallel to grain spacing, which is the same direction as the one that we were just looking at, right? Because we're looking at spacing between two bolts in the parallel to grain direction. And what is the requirement for that? It's 3DF. So I have two different requirements for the um, the spacing between the two bolts. And uh, obviously the one that's parallel to grain is going to be more, um, more stringent. So for the parallel to grain component of the force, my spacing within the row, so the rows are horizontal in that case because they are in the same direction as the loading, 
uh, or called the parallel to grain spacing in 0816. Uh, this, that's, that actual spacing is 99, as we just mentioned, this spacing right here. And um, the requirement for that one is 4DF, which is the one that we just looked at on the other page. And then we can also check the perpendicular component. Okay, so for that direction, in 0816 it's called SC. In 0816 it's called SP. So you notice for 0816 both of these are called the same thing. So that's helpful because it's basically the same dimension that we're talking about here. And uh, it's also it's still 99 millimeters and the requirement is 3DF, which is 38.1. So both of these are okay. Okay, so then we can continue and uh, do the spacing checks for the, the brace members. So for these brace members, um, we have the load in the bolts wants to go this way from the point of view of the brace. So to balance the external load on the brace pulling up and to the right, the bolts are resisting that with a down to the left force. Um, that load is parallel to the grain of that brace. So we only have parallel to grain load in the brace. And uh, except with respect to that loading direction, our brace um, bolt layout is staggered. They're not um, right directly adjacent to each other. Like they're not perpendicular to grain adjacent to each other. So we need to figure out, do we consider that as one row of bolts or two rows of bolts? As you'll recall a discussion that we had in a previous um, video where we discussed how to define um, the rows uh, in, a, in a connection in a piece of wood. So I'm gonna draw a bit the geometry of this piece in more detail. So this is basically the information that we have. Uh, this drawing is not one of my best. <laughs> But um, we can figure out all of the geometry from just these, um, just these points here. And also, uh, you know, we're assuming that these bolts are basically, um, that the spacing is equal um, on this side and this side. So we want to figure out basically these dimensions so that we can check the spacing requirements. We need those dimensions. We need this dimension here. Um, if we have these to continue, these would, if those are, were our rows, you know, then we need to know this dimension here, which would be our, um, our loaded end distance, right? So what's this one? We know, and we need to know this one here. Uh, okay. So how do we figure all of these out? Okay, well, the diagonal here, this one, we figure out using the angle. So these are all triangles, right? So we know this height. We know this angle. So therefore, we can figure out this dimension here as 141. Okay, so we're just using trigonometry. Um, or this is basically how all of these are going to work. So here we know this distance. We know this angle, so therefore we can figure out that this distance here is 70. Let me get rid of those lines. Okay, um, if those are in the middle, we can use the total width of this. This is um, a two by six, I think it was. So that means that this is 140, right? Okay, so that means that if that 70 is in the middle, then we have 35s on either side here. Okay, this is what we're assuming the brace is. Um, this here is going to be SC or SQ, depending on if you're 86, 14, or 19. This is going to be our unloaded edge distance, right? This is our EP. Same here, EP, because the load in the bolts does not go towards either of the edges. This here is going to be my A, 
uh, it's in this term is going to be AL, which is my loaded end distance. And this value here is um, 70, which we get from, again, this dimension and this angle being known as 45. And that is going to be our um, basically spacing. I'm going to call this uh, A spacing between the uh, bolts in the parallel to grain direction. Okay, so first of all, do we consider this as one row of bolts or two rows of bolts? Like, does our row go like this? Or are there two, one like this and one like this, two rows? Okay, well, you might remember that the requirement is whether that spacing S the spacing SC is less than or greater than um, this value A divided by four, okay? Where A is my uh, spacing between the bolts in adjacent rows, okay? And so that A value is 70 and divided by four gives us 17.5 millimeters. Our SC or SQ, if we're dealing with 08619, is, uh, is actually 70, right? Which is greater than A over four equals 17.5. So if it's greater than that value, therefore we're going to consider this to be two rows. And you can look back in the previous notes for a detailed, um, description of that requirement. Okay, so now let's check all the spacing as if these are two rows. So we have our loaded end distance. Now we're dealing with parallel to grain load only, right, which is this one. So now we have our A, L, or A. We're talking about a loaded end because the bolts are trying to pull out the end of the member. So we have the max of 5DF or 50 millimeters. So our actual loaded end distance here is this 141. So AL equals 141. So those are the two requirements, 5DF or 50 millimeters, whichever one is greater. And so this is true. Then we have our unloaded edge distance, which in this case is this EP of 35. Okay, and there are two requirements for unloaded edge distance. Um, it's, it has to be greater than 1.5 DF, which is 19, or 0.5 times the row spacing which in this case is 70, this value right here. And 0.5 times 70 is 35, and our unloaded distance is 35, so that's fine. We're okay, just barely. And the last requirement is our row spacing, which is our perpendicular to grain spacing. Our perpendicular grain spacing, which is 70 millimeters, this value right here, and that has to be greater than or equal to 3DF for parallel loads, parallel to grain loads, and that is 38.1. So therefore, this is also okay. Okay, so we have gone through and checked all of our um, spacing requirements now. So we're satisfied that the connection works geometrically but, and uh, now we're tasked to figure out what is the total resistance of this connection. Okay, so we have a bunch of different um, checks that we need to do. Let's maybe think about laying them all out. So what about for the beam? For the beam, we have to do, uh, well, for the whole connection together, we're gonna have to do yielding check. 
Okay, and as we've talked about before, there's only one yielding check for the whole connection because the yielding check takes into account the geometry of all the members that are connected together, right? So here we have a three member connection. So we do our yielding checks for three member connection and we come up with a yielding resistance. Okay, then we have to check both the beam and the brace separately. So for the beam, we're gonna have to do a row shear and net tension and splitting, right? Because since the beam in the beam, the load is on an angle, okay, we basically have to check everything for the beam, right? So we check row shear. Uh, remember for row shear, we don't necessarily have to be near the end of a beam to have row shear. We're not gonna do group tear out because we do need to have bolts pulling out of a beam for group tear out. So that one doesn't count because we're not near the end of the section for the beam. And we're gonna do splitting because there's a vertical component to the load. Okay, and we're also gonna do net tension, but we're gonna to have to make some assumptions for net tension because we don't know exactly what are the boundary conditions um, of the loads uh, through this beam at the end. So we're just gonna make an assumption to go with that for now. Okay, then I have to check the brace. For the brace, I only have parallel to grain loads. So I have to check my row shear, group tear out and net tension. And I will have group tear out in this case because from the point of view of the brace, the bolts wanna pull out the bottom and so they can take a chunk of material with them. Okay, so those are all of the checks that we're gonna do. I'm gonna start with the one that applies to the entire connection, which is the yielding resistance check. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's only one yielding resistance check for the entire connection. Okay, so um, first what I'm gonna do is find all the embedment strengths. And those are all the parameters that go into the Johansson yield equations. Then I'm gonna plug them into the Johansson yield equations to get the um, unit yielding resistance and U. Okay, so first I need to find my F1, which is my side plates the side members of my connection. So that's gonna be these ones out here, F1 and F1, and the middle one here is gonna be F2. And that's the way they're named in the standard. So the side plates are F1, my side plates are wood. Okay, so now we have to think about which direction the load is in the side plates, because you'll remember that our strength, my, our embedment strength for bolted connections is F theta, which is an interaction equation between load in the parallel direction, parallel to grain direction, and load in the perpendicular to grain direction. So let's look back at our connection here. Okay, so in the side plates, the bolts move this way. This Brace is the side member, right? So in those members, the load is parallel to grain only, right? So all I need to do is figure out for F1, my embedment strength in the side connector, the brace, I just need to figure out my FIP, which is my embedment strength parallel to grain. In the beam, right, in the beam, from the point of view of the beam, the bolts move in the opposite direction like this, but they have some component in the parallel to grain direction and some component in the perpendicular to grain direction. So when I calculate my embedment strength for the beam, which is gonna be F2, I need to calculate my Fi theta, which is my interaction between my Fip, the embedment strength parallel to grain, and my Fiq, which is my embedment strength perpendicular to grain. So I'm gonna to have to calculate um, both of those numbers and then apply the interaction equation to figure out the embedment strength for F2. Okay, so f the F, the embedment strength, and the direction of that embedment strength depends on which member I'm talking about. Okay, so it depends on the orientation of the load from the bolt in each individual member. So for F1, which is the side plate again, as I mentioned, the load is parallel to grain. Okay, so let's find our G value, which you'll recall is our um, relative density. Okay, these members are SPF, 
So we are talking about SPF, visually graded lumber. So our mean oven dry relative density is 0 0.42. Okay, so now my embedment strength in the parallel direction. Okay, so this is my equation for FIP. Jx is one because we're not dealing with CLT. So if I sub in all these numbers, I get an FIP of 18.3 MPa. Okay, once I know my FIP, I need to calculate my Fi theta. Remember, this has a big, um, a big interaction equation. Remember, this looks like FIP times FIQ divided by um, FIP sine squared theta. Okay, times KD times KSF KT. So remember that since my load component is parallel, this is going to simplify. Okay, so this means FI theta is going to be just equal to FIP. Let me write that a bit better. Times KD times KSF times KT because when theta equals zero, Theta equals zero means the load is parallel to grain in that member. And when theta equals zero, basically that means that FIP sine squared theta equals zero, FIP co -square, sorry, FIQ co squared theta equals FIQ. And so FIP, FIQ divided by FIQ is just FIP. Right, these all cross out. And so we get um, 18.3 times KD is 1.0 times our KSF, which was 0 0.67 times KT of 1.0 and our FIQ equals 12.3 MPa. And this is basically our F2 equals our FI theta. Oh, sorry, F1. F1 equals Fi theta equals 12.3 MPa. Okay, so that is the embedment strength. All that work is just to find the embedment strength in the side member. Now we have to do the same thing for the main member, the middle member, the center member, which is also wood. Okay, so now we have to say what, which direction is the bolt load in the main member, in the center member. So if we go back up to our drawing and we look at it from the point of view of the beam, okay, which is the way that these red arrows are drawn right now. Okay, we know the bolts wanna push up and to the right. And what is the angle of that force? It is the same as the angle of the brace, which is 45 degrees. So that's our angle to grain that we're gonna use now for this uh, embedment strength interaction equation. Okay, so the G is the same because we're talking about the same material, so it has the same relative density. Our embedment strength parallel is basically exactly the same equation that we had above, and we get the same answer, 18.3. And then for the perpendicular to grain component, it's just basically 22 over 50 times um, the value for FIP, so it is a smaller embedment strength for a perpendicular to grain direction, and we get a value of 8.1. Now our theta degree is 45 degrees. That's the angle to grain of the force, force relative to the parallel to grain direction. And so now we can do our full interaction equation for Fi theta. And if I sub all of those things in, then I'm going to get that F2 equals Fi theta equals uh, 7.5 MPa. Okay, so um, it uh, would the 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 term on the on the left, this term here, will realistically be somewhere between 8.1 and 18.3. But then since we have KSF of 0.67 we get a value of 7.5 MPa. Next, we need the Fy. 
which is given in the case of an A307 volt as being 310 MPa. Now, what about our thicknesses? These are the last things that we need basically for our calculation. So if I go back up and look, okay, these are all 38 millimeters thick. They're all two bys. Okay, so the middle member for sure, the thickness is gonna be 38. But for our outer member here, we need to remove the depth of this countersink. So it's gonna be 38 minus this 13 millimeter countersink. That's the, that's the rule. If I countersink the head of the bolt so that it's located um, inside the surface of the um, piece of wood, then I can't include the thickness of the countersink in my um, strength equation because basically the bolt is not bearing on that area of the countersink. So it's like it's not even there for the purpose of the strength of the member. So T1 is the side member. So T1, oops. So T1 is going to be 38 millimeters minus the countersink of 30, 13 millimeters, and that's gonna give us 25 millimeters. And T2, which is the middle member, is just gonna be 38 millimeters. Okay, so now I can go ahead and calculate my NU values now that I have all of my embedment strengths and my thicknesses. Okay, so only Johansson yield equations A, C, D, and G are going to apply in this case, since we are talking about a three member connection. So I'm just gonna go through them quickly without much comment. Okay, so if I do all of those Johansson yield equations, then I get a failure mode of C that governs. So if I compare all these together, this one C is the lowest one. So that's the strength that governs. That's the failure mode that governs, which is um, basically failure of the center member, which makes sense because it's embedment failure of the center member that one C, because you can see that I have two side members and one center member, and they're all the same thickness. So if it's not the bolt yield that's gonna do it, then um, the middle member is certainly gonna fail before the outer ones, which makes sense for a number of reasons. I mean, it's got less material overall, even when I remove the countersink, and also a component of that force is perpendicular to grain in the center member, which is weaker. Okay, so that passes the sanity check. <clears throat> so failure mode C governs. Okay, so now that I know what my unit yielding resistance is, I can find my overall yielding resistance. So I have two shear planes. And I have a number of fasteners is two. Shear, two shear planes because I have three members, three member connections, so the bolt is yielding across two planes. Okay, so if I sub in all of those values into the total, uh, the total overall yielding resistance equation, NR equals phi Y N U N S N F, then I get that the total yielding resistance of my um, connection is 5.8 kilonewtons. And that's in the direction of the load. Okay, so I'm gonna put in a cut here, and then we're gonna start calculating the resistances of the beam members, which we talked about were row shear, uh, net tension, and splitting. Um, so see you in the next video.